Our guest speaker today is Trisha McCannon. And the topic she is going to talk on is Jesus and the Great White Brotherhood. Now, for nearly 2,000 years, stories have circulated about the appearance of the three Magi at Jesus' birth. But who were they and what brotherhood of wisdom guided them there? Trisha McCannon, author of the books Dialogues with the Angels and the exciting new release, Jesus, the Explosive Story of the 30 Lost Years and the Ancient Mystery Religions, takes you on a journey into the heart of the great mysteries, revealing little known evidence culled from the Vatican and hard to find historical sources. That Jesus studied with the masters of Egypt, Britain, India, Persia, and Judea, all various chapters of the great white brotherhood, who, brotherhood whose wisdom has long overseen our planet. Historian, symbolic com cosmologist, international author and speaker, Tricia will discuss the many hermetic similarities between myst mystical Christianity and teachings, I can't read that word, of the school. Please welcome Tricia McKinnon. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, good afternoon. We, we finally have beautiful weather out there, and so I salute you for actually being here in the physical inside on a day where it's not freezing out there. Um, I look around and see many familiar faces and then some faces that I don't know. So I would like to just sort of, um, in the beginning, find out a little bit about all of you, and I'll tell you a little bit about myself, and then we're going to jump in to our topic. So um, how many of you are... Uh, have been with the Theosophical Society for a year or more. How many of you are new to the Theosophical Society? How many of you just come today for the first time? How many of you know what the Theosophical Society, how it got formed or anything? It's very cool. I'll tell you in just a moment. Okay, in, within your spiritual traditions, how many of you uh, sort of grew up Judeo-Christian? Okay, how many Jewish? How many Christian? How many of you would still say that you um, would consider yourself some form of, let us say, an expanded Christian? How many of you are not sure if you really want to know anything about Jesus anymore? Oh, gosh. Good. We have an interested audience. This is very good. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I am a clairvoyant who has had that gift since I was a little girl. Um, I grew up here in Atlanta across from a large forest and I spent a lot of time in the forest and perhaps like many of you in this room because I know I'm speaking with other healers and people who are more esoterically based I um, could see little divas in the forest when I was a child little fairy people and after a while this larger angelic presence appeared and the little divas who are like the guardian spirits of the nature kingdom. All of us have our own, let us say, guardian angels, but the plant kingdom does as well. They were very surprised that I could see them. And they really weren't particularly interested in human affairs unless it impacted their world with nature. But after a while, this larger angelic being appeared and uh, explained to me that he was sort of the overseer of that forest. That was his job. And he looked more like what we would consider an angelic, an angel. Um, growing up, my family was fundamentalist and evangelical Christian. So having that mystical sight was a little challenging. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Well, I think this is really true for a lot of children who come in with those gifts more open, and then after a while they get closed down. My first book, Dialogues with the Angels, and I only brought uh, a few copies in the back, really chronicles uh, how uh, this inner sight worked for me and how I did a lot of praying growing up that someone wiser than myself would show up. Um, and that at the age of 19, a group of masters who are connected with the Great White Brotherhood actually did show up. And that group is called the Viragi Masters. How many of you have heard of the Viragi? Oh, great. This is so cool. I see hands up. Well, the Viragi are a very elusive group of masters, primarily in the East, but they, um, East, the Far East and the Middle East, people like uh, Rumi, Shamasi, Tabriz, Kabir, are these names you would 
have heard of. These were actually Viragi masters. Um, Virag means detachment or truth. And these are beings who are very committed to something that they call Jivan Murti. Jivan Murti means spiritual liberation within this lifetime, Haididi. So their purpose is for each one of us who really wants to make contact with them to become spiritually liberated or free of the things that hold us back in this world, which of course means a lot of things about our personalities that are very challenging. You know, all of us, <clears throat> we may have I can't believe Cindy came, yay! <laughs> um, unity in the morning, the Theosophical Society in the afternoon. Oh, she's a busy girl. So the Viragi Masters teach something called the ancient science of soul travel, which is the ability that each one of us has as a soul to deliberately learn to shift our consciousness while we're still in the physical body and to travel into the higher worlds. Now they do this through two... Um, let us say streams, the stream of light and the stream of sound, who they, they believe that the three most powerful expressions of the divine that we can experience down here are love, sound, and light, the three principles. Everything is love. It begins with the word. In the beginning was the word, the vibrational sound, seed syllables that create manifestation. And as the planes, the dimensional planes are created, the sound underpins all creational reality. And then from that sound, we move into photonic light. So they teach specific practices of how you can, let us say, hook into this sound, which they call the bani, B-A-N-I. The ekshar is another word for it. The shabda is another word for it. These are all words for the same thing. The audible life stream or the sound current. And by learning to open your inner hearing, you can actually surf in from the third dimension, which is where we are, through the fourth, to the fifth, to the sixth, to the seventh, eventually into the heart of creation itself. Now, this sound is more subtle for most people to perceive than the light. Some of us are more clairaudient, some of us are more clear, um, clear visual or clairvoyant. Um, I, I am more of a seer, but I have been able to hear the sound current since I was a child. But there are other times I can't hear it at all. You know, when you hear it, I mean, sometimes it's very deep, like a roar. Sometimes it's high-pitched. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay. Now, it changes frequency as you move through the dimensions. I remember years ago reading that on the, in the causal plane, it sounded like the... Um, uh, buzzing of bees, and I thought, oh, the buzzing, can't possibly sound like the buzzing of bees. Mm -hmm. Well, one day I was meditating, and sure enough, bzzz, it was like, like, well, it was like where's, is there a fly, is there a bee? Bzzz, it was, in fact, it was, sounded exactly like the buzzing of bees. Uh -huh. On this dimensional level, it sounds like the roaring of the ocean. You know how when you put the seashell to your ear? How many of you have, have done that? That's actually like very similar to the sound that vibrates throughout this dimension. So one of the great gifts that the Viragi had for me at the age of 19 was they had a road map, a road map of the dimensions. And this is huge because if you don't have a map, you don't know where you are and you certainly don't know where you're going. How many of you can relate to that one? So this was a huge gift that they had. I remember... When I was 19, I was at Florida State University, and I saw this poster that said, The Voice of the Master, and I, I was just, it like, struck me to the core, you know, and I um, had a film history class that night, and so I got there late, and it was, you know, down to maybe the last 30 minutes of this meeting, and I went in, and I literally saw the God World's chart, and this bright light appeared, and this cone around it, and I heard this voice in my head that said, this is the, pl the path I have placed you on, beloved. Follow it. And so the guy who was teaching, who was a third initiate, was being asked by Christians in the audience, can you soul travel and still be a Christian? And of course the answer to that is, of course, yes. I mean, what do you think Jesus was doing, you know? And, uh, but the guy that was speaking, I think he sort of had, you know, thrown the baby out with the bathwater a long time ago. He hadn't kind of reconciled his own Judeo-Christian background, and so he really didn't know how to answer that. So I raised my hand, and I said, 
Well, you know, Jesus was bilocating, doing remote healing, remote, um, you know, sensing, you know, I was talking about all the things he did. And afterwards, people came up to me and said, how long have you been on this path? And I said, oh, about 30 minutes, you know. <laughs> and so the Varagi masters were very powerful teachers for me. So in the outside world, you know, I was a commercial photographer. I still have a 5,000 square foot studio here in Atlanta. Uh, you know, I've shot for Coke, IBM, Georgia Pacific, all those people. But my inner world was very much about developing and cultivating these very strong inner gifts and inner bodies. And it took me probably about a year and a half before I saw the, saw the light. That almost sounds, I saw the light. I saw the light. But before I actually saw the light for the first time. When it, you, when it appears in the beginning, it usually appears on the peripheral of your vision, okay? It takes a long time to where you can actually develop enough to be able to look directly at it. And it'll appear many times as a blue light or um, sometimes gold, sometimes white, and occasionally purple. The different colors indicate who, who's there. The blue and the purple are always masters, <clears throat> okay? The white and the gold are usually... Um, not always, but they're usually angels. Okay, that's a, a pretty good rule of thumb. Um, so all during my 20s, I was very much involved with that. When I was about 27, I mean, the Masters had, I was very busy on the inner planes. A number of things happened. Um, the, this one Master I had been working with used to uh, take me to uh, the movie theater. <laughs> on the inner planes, <laughs> and I would watch these movies, and I would like be like, oh, that was the greatest movie. I'd like wake up the next morning like, wow, what a movie, and then I think, that, that's not down here yet. I could write that movie. I think I will by George, and so I started writing screenplays. Now, one of those was about UFOs. Well, I had seen UFOs since I was a little girl. I'd seen them in broad daylight. I'd seen them at night. I thought everybody saw them, okay? How many of you have seen UFOs? Oh, good. That's great. I'm among my people. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so, so I, uh, you know, I, I thought, well, <clears throat> you know, I don't, had never read a book or anything about it, but I thought, well, you know, maybe I should, like, read a book or something before I took six weeks off from work and wrote the screenplay so that it was at least reflective of the truth. Instead, I went to a MUFON conference, the Mutual UFO Network, and I sat there for three days and listened to those archaeologists and anthropologists and ex-military people and ex all of these people spoke openly about the fact that they existed and they were showing evidence. And I thought, holy smokes. Well, I actually came back to Atlanta, set up an organization, and I'm saying this because one of our audience members knows me from that time, called the UFO Forum, and for eight years I brought in ex-NASA people, ex-military people, physicists, engineers, psychologists, et cetera, et cetera, to speak here in Atlanta. Well, some two or three years into this, my guides said, <clears throat> time for you to sort of know what your own connection is. So, um, <clears throat> That was a, a very powerful process where I, I actually discovered my connection with these, let us say, the White Brotherhood and the um, Intergalactic Councils and what I was really doing. And like many of us, I think we, uh, you know, we've come down here to serve in this very crucial time in Earth's history. How many of you feel like that's true for you? I think it's really true for a lot of us light workers. Well, uh, my guides then told me, time for you to start speaking, which since I had been Clark Kent in Atlanta, and I had really kept my identity as a clairvoyant and a, and a seer and a mystic pretty hidden because I didn't really think it was good for business, you know. I see some smiles and nods in the audience. I, um, I said, well, I'm not speaking here in Atlanta, uh-uh. <laughs> and they're like, no problem, we're sending you to Los Angeles. So I was like, what? And they, I mean, they said, we want you to rent an auditorium, buy a plane ticket, and go out there and speak for three days. Well, the startling thing is that I actually did it. I mean, it's really an amazing thing, because that's a lot of money. And I didn't know there was a speaking circuit. I mean, nobody knew me from Adam's house cat. I didn't have any idea there were expos. Well, I went out there and spoke for Friday night and all day Saturday. And because I'm a photographer, and my dad was a lawyer, and my family's fundamentalist, and they definitely feel like if, you know, you're not giving their version of reality back to them, you're going to burn in hell for all eternity. I tend to be very evidentially based. 
So even though I'm a mystic who sees these things, I'm heavily uh, historically grounded. Uh, and my book, for example, has 100 pages of bibliography, footnotes, and appendix because it's a very, very serious piece of uh, historical work. And hopefully, we'll wind up acting as a bridge for a lot of people who are in the Judeo-Christian world and are beginning to open to a larger view of reality. Let's put it like that. So for many years, I traveled and spoke and taught all over the world. I was probably in about 10 to 15 cities in the US and about three countries a year. And um, people asked me, did I have a book? And I finally managed to get the marvelous Dialogues with the Angels out, which really chronicles not only those early days, but how the teachings of the Viragi impacted me and how they teach, the type of spirit guides all of us have, because we all do have guides. And angels are only one of the types of guides. There are muses, there are shamanic power animals. Once in a while, you meet people who actually have masters. When we start talking about a group like this, who is the Theosophical Society is really based on their connection with the Great White Brotherhood. You're talking about people who may in fact have masters around their energy field. Most people don't have masters. The masters have better things to do. You know, they, they, they sort of, you, the masters come online in your field really only for three reasons. You've either known them in the past and you've served the higher, uh, let us say, the higher good of humanity in another lifetime. Consequently, they know who you are. You have soul, or, or you have soul contracts with them in this lifetime in order to serve for the higher good of humanity in a very large way. Or you have known them in the past in a physical life. Those are usually the three levels. And those soul contracts take place in the fifth dimension before you ever come in. So in my book, I talk about the many different kinds of guides, the way you can learn to ride the shop, the current forward. And then I talk about how my life changed really when a group of beings called the Council of Nine came in. The Council of Nine are the nine primordial waveform energies that create, maintain, and sustain everything in the universe. <coughs> now that sounds like a very big statement, doesn't it? These are vibrational presences of divine love that completely changed my life. In the heart of them are the eagle and the dove, the divine father energy and the divine mother energy, and of course the, cl the classic trinity of the divine son. Now I first experienced the divine son some two years into working with and channeling Rigel and Ariel, or the divine father and divine mother. Um, and that presence uh, called itself Sabaoth. Uh, the presence was so powerfully hot that when I channeled, and I was channeling publicly, you know, for 150 to 300, sometimes even 1,000 people publicly out on the road in New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and so forth. When Sabaoth's energy came in, it could not be grounded down in just to the heart, you know, like Ariel, the Divine Mother, she's all about the heart. Complete forgiveness, love, compassion, you know, in the most beautiful way. She's the creatress from which all aspects of the Divine Mother come. Rigel, the Divine Father energy, who, you know, they, they've been known by different names throughout the centuries. But certainly, you know, one of his expressions was Horus, where one of her expressions was Isis within the Egyptian mysteries. And I teach the Egyptian mysteries. Uh, but, we've, but, you know, the Divine Mothers had many expressions. That's why as Isis, she was known as she of 10,000 names and 10,000 faces, because she comes again and again and again and again. Lakshmi, you know, Pravati, Mary, Mary Magdalene, Durga, um, you know, Aphrodite, Ishtar, I mean, we can go on and on. And I teach goddess work. That's one of the many traditions that I'm trained in. But when Sabaoth came in, his energy was so extreme. It was so, it was like fire. It was like sitting in the middle of fire. And I couldn't just, you know, my chakras were like, you know, how most people, I don't know if you all have found this, but it seems like this, like, especially in the past, there are like two kinds of people. The people that have their bottom chakras going, and those people are about sex, money, and power, but they're not very awakened here. And then there's all of us, and we're like really great from the heart up, but you know, where's the money? 
you know, <laughs> you know, not much of a sex life, most of us, and, you know, where's the power? So it's kind of like you got people who are really great up here, but not so good down here, and people who are, like, making money out there and, you know, building buildings and running the world, and they're not very enlightened, but they've got these bottom ones going. Well, I was kind of like that, too. So, you know, when, when Sabaoth came in, I had to find a way to ground him down into those first three chakras. And the energy comes in as a spiral. Well, you know, the, the kidneys go like this. When we breathe, I don't know if you all know this, but they, they breathe in and out on both sides. So when his energy would come in, it was okay for this kidney. But when it came around, it froze this kidney because the power was so strong that it made it so that this kidney couldn't move anymore. So I actually had to go through a very deep process of getting my bottom three chakras opened, which was a, you know, quite an extraordinary <laughs> experience and a little painful, but nonetheless, it really helped. Well, that was when I, later I was to find um, references to Sabaoth in the Chaldean oracles of Zoroaster, which begin, and God is he having the head of a hawk infinite and without ending. He is the never-ending spiral. And he created him then the first mind that all people shall say is, you know, the, the first God, but is not really. And that being is the being of light, Sabaoth. Okay? So this would be the Christ energy. Okay? Now, it was such a powerful energy. This is the energy that creates all the worlds, that lights all the suns, all the galaxies. As you can imagine, it was a little overwhelming for me. And so, you know, he would come in and, and channel to me. Please have a seat. No problem. He would come in and channel to me, and he would say, I am the energy that coaxes the seed from the dark soil that gives light to the world, you know, with the tender fingers of my light, okay? And so he was trying to help me to experience him in a more gentle way, this very powerful energy. We're talking about the divine solar energy, the son of God, the classic son of God. So, hi, new people. <laughs> so, um, so, this is most interesting because about five years ago, I wound up coming off the road to write my second book. And I knew if I was really going to go to the next level of what the powerful council of nine had showed me that I really had to have a library w so I could do footnotes. And you can't do that on an airplane or on the road. You actually have to be at home, you know, handcuff yourself to your computer and do the work. So I started a book on the profound events that had been happening to me as I was traveling the world and how this would impact the world in terms of the polar shift that's coming in terms of the prophecies of 2012 and 2017, in terms of the return of the Christ and the great Maitreya, in terms of the, um, the prophecies really for the healing of the planet after a time of general destruction. And so I was about 150 pages into this, and I thought, my gosh, this is, you know, really too advanced for me to just start off with this because, I mean, on page one, I'm bitten by a 17-foot-long rattlesnake and, you know, um, fall into a coma for three months. And the way that I'm able to decipher this is because, of course, I'm a priestess of Isis, and I understand shamanically that the snake is not a bad symbol. It's actually a symbol for enlightenment. Well, that's on page one. So if you can imagine, this was, I thought, okay, maybe I need to, like, back up and help my readers to just kind of ease in because most of us have come from that Judeo-Christian background. So I began a second book, which was really about how, when I was 27 years old, I was contacted by the priestesses of Isis. Now, this happened when I was in um, the dream state. It was a lucid soul travel experience. And um, I dreamt that I had gone back to school for my master's degree. You know, it's so funny how they, you know, the master's, <laughs> my master's degree. And I woke up in this dorm room, and there were these hieroglyphic symbols on the wall. Well, I fell back asleep, but I kept trying to remember, what were the symbols? I knew they were important. And when I woke up, they were gone. So I went to the library to, to look up the one symbol I could remember, which was a circle with a dot at the center. Now, this is the beginning of my learning of hermetics. And hermetics is the symbol language of the soul. And I teach hermetics. 
In fact, in the book, the new book, Jesus, the Explosive Story, it's such a long, long title. I used to, I was calling it The Lost Years of Jesus and the Secret Schools of Initiation, which was a lot easier. But they changed the title, so now it's Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> the Explosive Story of the 30 Lost Years and the Ancient Mystery Religions. And that's a long title, but it does really say what it's about. It's not only about his journeys through these many lands, but who he trained with, who he studied with. But I'm also teaching the ancient uh, wisdom of hermetics. And hermetics is the secret symbol language of the soul that was used by the ancients to convey these deep mystical truths. They are portals, these symbols are portals and doorways that awaken your consciousness and move you like an initiatory experience to the next level. And that's really what I'm about, is, an, is helping to people to literally awaken to their higher selves. Uh, and I do this in a number of different ways. Certainly through transmission is one of the ways, and I can have to give all credit to my guides for that, who are definitely in today. Um, but through the book, but also through this Egyptian mystery school that I have been teaching for the last five years. And I'm having a very shortened prelude to the next um, <clears throat> mystery school circle that begins this Wednesday at Unity North. It's only $20 to come. It's eight weeks. It's March and April for eight Wednesday nights. And I would really urge any of you that are really interested in understanding the great mysteries to come to it. I've tried to make it very affordable for people so that everyone can come. And there are flyers on it in the back and a, and a, and a poster somewhere. Oh, there's the poster. Okay. So here we are, back at this symbol. So I went to the library to try to find this symbol. And the only thing I knew in my head, this symbol meant the beginning of all things and the end of all things. Now, I didn't even know how I knew that, but I knew that that's what the symbol meant. And when I got to the library, the librarian, the student assistant, came and got me and said, there's a phone call for you at the front desk. And I was like, for me? Nobody even knows I'm here. And I went to the phone, and the woman on the other end of the phone said, is this Trisha McCannon? And I said, yes, who's this? And she said, we've called to tell you that your dreams are real. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, who's this? And she said, we're from the priestesses of Isis, and that's all we're permitted to tell you at this time. And then she hung up. <laughs> And then I woke up, and it was a dream within a dream. Mm -hmm. And I thought, who the heck are the priestesses of Isis? It was some, like, ancient Egyptian cult or something, you know? I mean, I had no idea. So about two months later, I was um, right down at Monroe and Piedmont at uh, a little, beautiful little store called Illumina, which was under Roussan's, that marvelous sushi restaurant. I don't think Illumina's there anymore, but it was very beautiful. And I had gone in to kill some time. And I was looking at this beautiful Egyptian statue of the goddess Ma'at, which represents cosmic truth. But of course, at that time, I didn't know that. And the woman behind the counter said, are you interested in Egyptian things? And I said, uh, yeah, I've been dreaming of the priestesses of Isis. And she said, oh, tell me your dreams. And then I like, realized I had spoken out loud. And I said, well, I'm not sure you know, you're going to understand my dreams. I'm not even sure I understand them. And she said, Try me. I'm a hierophant in the priestesses of Isis. Mm. I was like, holy Toledo. <laughs> so this was actually to become my shaman teacher when I was about 30 years old. <clears throat> and over a course of many years, I became trained in the goddess mysteries, the Egyptian mysteries, the Celtic mysteries, and the Native American twisted hair traditions. So in the last five years, as I've set up the Phoenix Fire Lodge, the Order of the Eagle and the Dove, so we can see in that name we have Divine Father, Divine Mother, and Divine Son energy all together, I transmit these, these teachings. And that's really what I've been doing for the last five years. And I've been doing it because I've been able to be here in Atlanta. Now, you guys are my home base, but, you know, come summer, I'll be going off to Europe, and come the fall, I'll be going off to speak nationally. So you have me for only a little window of time before I go back into, you know, this, I've been in the cave, in the Jesus cave, and I'm coming out. I can see some light at the end of that tunnel, okay? So what I'd like to do today is to talk a little bit about the Great White Brotherhood and to talk about hermetics 
and the symbol, the symbol language of the soul. Would you guys like that? Okay, I want to begin by just posing the question, how, why do you all think that the Great White Brotherhood named themselves the Great White Brotherhood? Are there any ideas in this audience? I'll give you a clue. It wasn't sexist and it wasn't racist, okay? Very important in this day and age because we're all sensitive to these things, but it had nothing to do with any of that. Does anybody have any ideas? White aura. White aura. Very good idea. Good, good. Anybody else? Oh, he's like right to it, oh, the arrow, oh, right at that target. In fact, white was, of course, the color closest to purity and illumination, enlightenment. And their purpose is to enlighten matter, okay? That is also our purpose. It's not for us to just, you know, get the hell out of here, okay? <laughs> okay, it's actually for us to bring light in, to bring it into our cells, to bring it into our actions, to bring it into our thoughts, to bring it into the world of matter so that we enlighten matter. So the symbol that they chose that was representative of this was this symbol, in fact. Now, how many of you can tell me anything about this symbol? Does anybody know anything? Well, it's the disc. Now that's a very interesting uh, way of putting it. I think he's really going in the right direction. But um, let me just see what other ideas we have in the room before I kind of give you some of the, the interpretations of the masters. Anybody else have anything that they want to share about this? Tamara? It is the symbol for gold. And in fact, it is the ancient symbol for the sun. Okay. Astrology is the sun. It is the sun. Now, when you start looking at, you know, the mysteries, what were the mysteries? The mysteries were, were a series of teachings that um, engaged both the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain. In other words, the logical brain and the intuitive, the feminine and the masculine. And it did it in a very specific way in order to allow their initiates to have direct experiences, out-of-body experiences, in the inner planes to realize that we actually are eternal souls having a mortal experience, okay? And they did this through a, 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 many, a series of very systemized teachings. These teachings took place on three levels, okay? Um, does anybody have any idea what these levels were? Besides Tamara, who is one of my priestesses in my mystery school, and Linda, who probably also knows because she's from my mystery school, and Ellie, right, <laughs> and Ron, <laughs> right? Okay, you can't cheat. You can't tell them. Anybody else? Okay. Well, these three levels represented, if you ever look at a picture of Isis, okay, she always has this crown on, okay? Now, Egyptologists and archaeologists have interpreted this as the, the, the throne that she was holding for her son Horus. And if you know the story of Isis and Osiris, how many of you know that story? How many of you don't know that story? Very, very important story. Okay, the story is basically that after the flood, the great flood, where there's just straggly humans starving to death in the mountains, you know, the ones that were left, you know, Noah and his sons, and I'm sure that there were a few hundred or a thousand others on tops of mountain peaks starving to death, hoping someone would come rescue them. <clears throat> Isis and Osiris were two of the people who were very committed to the saving of the human race. And <clears throat> um, Isis wound up basically uh, being left in charge of the northern part of Egypt. She was the great civilizer. As they say, she uh, instituted marriage, inventor of the first laws, inventor of the loom, inventor of the sail. I mean, you name it, she did it. Okay, amazing being. While Osiris traveled the world saving people. Now, the way he would do it, he was a musician. 
and he would um, create sound and music and draw these straggling people together and he'd feed them. And then he would bring them the arts of agriculture and teach them how to plant so that they could feed themselves. Consequently, and he did this for 450 years. These are very long-lived beings. These are Anunnaki gods whose average lifespan on this planet is about 500,000 years. Okay? And Osiris was said to be very tall. The Anunnaki women are about 9 to 10 feet. The men are about 11 to 15 feet. He was about 15 feet tall. He was loved all over the world. Okay? Um, his brother, his half-brother, Set, was very, very jealous of him. And Set, on one of Osiris's visits back, Set knew Isis couldn't come, so he threw a party. And uh, in the party, he basically had prepared this golden coffin and said, whoever can get in it, like a party joke, you know, can have it. Well, everyone tried, and eventually they talked Osiris into doing it, and as soon as they did, you know, his conspirators, 72 conspirators, put the lid on, sealed it with lead, and threw him in the Nile River. Well, of course, Isis, knowing this, knew exactly what this meant. This meant that Set was going to take over Egypt, and also Set was very interested in having a child with her. So she knew everything was in danger. So she went in search of him. It took her a long time to find him, and when she eventually did, um, she found him in the city of Bilbos, and his coffin had uh, caught in a tamarisk tree. And it had become a great, and a tamarisk tree is very much connected with the tree of life, just as Jesus is connected with the tree of life. And uh, she briefly was able to resurrect him. This was the first resurrected Lord of Light before Jesus, and uh, impregnate herself with his child. And eventually she had Horus, who she had to hide because she knew that, you know, he would be killed the moment his existence was known. Horus eventually, after 350 years, grew up, challenged his evil uncle, Set, who had, you know, done terrible things to Egypt at that time, and eventually won, restoring justice, light, and truth. Now, these beings are part of what are called the four great Kumaras. The four Kumaras I talk about in the book, most people know nothing about the Kumaras, but they're spoken of in the Vedas. There are four of them for the four cardinal points. And Jesus talks about this in the Sophia of Jesus the Christ, the Gnostic Gospel. Jesus says that the Divine Mother exists beyond the worlds of time and space, but she comes into the world again and again and again. The Divine Father cannot come into the world directly. He exists beyond the worlds of time and space, but he can come in through his sons, okay, the sons of God, the return of the Lords of Light. And in fact, this coming week, on Wednesday, I begin speaking about the Philosopher's Stone, and on Thursday, at, at Unity North, but on Thursday, I'm speaking at the Phoenix and Dragon right down the street about the return of the Lords of Light, and that will actually be a PowerPoint presentation. It's only because this is like an hour, hour and 15 minutes that I'm not speaking with slides, but since I'm such a high visual, I really believe in entertainment while we're being enlightened, okay? So we'll be doing a gorgeous presentation on the return of the Shepherd Kings, the return of the Lord of Light, and the signs and symbols through which you can know who these beings are, because believe me, they're on their way back. That's exactly what's happening now. It's a very, very crucial time in wor world history. Now, who are the four great Kumaras? The word Kumara, Ku, Ma, Ra. Well, let's analyze it. Ra is the Lord of Light. Ma is the Divine Mother. And Ku, K-H-U, is the name of the higher self. So here we have the high self that is the perfect balance of the Divine Mother and Father. Okay. Who are they? Does anybody know a name for any of the Kumaras? I'm sure you do in this group. Madame Blavatsky certainly did. Sanat Kumara. Sanat, who is Sanat Kumara? He is, in fact, the head of the Great White Brotherhood, Sanat Kumara. Now, who is the second Kumara? Well, that would happen to be Jesus, Sananda. The third Kumara is Sananka, who is Thoth. And Sanandana is the fourth one. Let me tell you how I learned about these beings. This book that I wrote, 
Jesus, the explosive <clears throat> story, et cetera, et cetera. That book, I was, as I said, I was in the middle of writing one book, then I moved to another book, and the second book, Decoding the Mysteries of the Ages, I was some 600 pages into it, and I had put three little chapters on Jesus. One about his secret teachings, one about his lost years that nobody knew about, and one about why he came at the pivotal point between the end of the age of Aries and the beginning of the age of Pisces, okay? And then I kept writing. But as I went along, I kept, I, I, I would think, well, I bet they don't know this about Jesus. I just have to put this in, and I have to put this in. And before I knew it, I had 200 pages on Jesus inside of this larger book. And so then I'm thinking, Mom, Mamma Mia, you know, what can't I just write in a straight line? You know, they're having babies, these books, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And of course it's because it's really all connected, but if you're going to prove it, you also have to be detailed. So of course my book was getting longer and longer and longer. So I'm thinking what to do. So I was laying on the floor of my office between Christmas and Thanksgiving, and I had my hand over my eyes. And I uh, became aware that Jesus was actually standing over me. Now you must remember that I have... I've seen masters and angels, I mean, which are always extraordinary and wonderful, and I don't mean to make it sound like it's not fabulous, it completely is, and I'm always honored when they show up. But I had looked for Jesus, you know, I mean, my family is fundamentalist, right? You know, I was Episcopalian confirmed, I've gone down there, where are you? <laughs> On the knees, you know, where are you? Could you just show yourself? I'd really, really like to see you. But in fact, no cigar, nothing had ever happened for me. Have any of you ever had anything happen? Well, I was hoping something would happen, you know. The only time I'd ever had any experience with him, with him was three years before. Three years before, I was in San Francisco, and uh, I had been speaking at the Whole Life Expo, one of those big shows, and I stayed over for the week to do readings. As a clairvoyant, I've done over 6,000 readings for people around the world, et cetera, et cetera. I had three wonderful people come to see me for readings, and afterwards they wanted to take me to lunch. So we went to this little bistro and we're sitting there chatting and suddenly the door of the restaurant opened and Jesus came in to the restaurant and I was like, well, and he came and sat down next to me and I'm like thinking, what are you doing here? And the women were just like, oh, we just left our reading and so forth and so on. And I mean, I couldn't even, it's like, doesn't anybody else see him, you know? And he never said anything. And so um, I excused myself and got up and went to the bathroom. And it was like a little one room, you know, bathroom with a terrazzo floor. And I locked the door and I got down on my knees. And he was hovering about a foot off the floor, just looking at me. And I said, well, I said, I don't know what you're doing here or anything, but, you know, if you need some help, I mean, I'm perfectly willing to help, you know. He never said anything. And I was like, and by the way, you know, if you could, like, help with my screwed up family, that would really be good, you know. <laughs> you know, I've done everything I possibly can with my family, but, you know, alas, Nothing has worked, so, you know, but it's not contingent, okay? I'll help anyway. So he never said anything. He just emanated out this huge energy, just <sighs> opened my heart so big. I see her nodding her head. That, that's the thing about him. He's just I, I just, I don't even know how to describe the energy. It's so profoundly beautiful. And so after about five minutes, the energy moved off, and I got up, and I went, back outside and you know I I think that I had gotten on this radar screen because one of those women had a profound connection with Jesus mm -hmm. she actually had been writing channel stuff and I think that's really that's my guess that's how he came to notice me was because of her and so <clears throat> I, I never knew what that was about so here we are three years later I'm laying on the floor of my office and suddenly I see this, you know, my hands like this, I see this bright light coming in. And I move my hand, and he's standing over me. And he says, without any preamble, telepathically, I want you to write a book about my lost years and secret teachings. There's been enough war and bloodshed in my name. And, of course, you know, I was, like, <clears throat> stunned. that. Then I was like, well, could I finish this other book? First, I'm almost out of money. You know, <laughs> you, you know how we are. We're in our little mortal brains. Can I finish this other book first? And he smiled and he just waved his hand like, "Don't worry, I'll open every door. It'll be easy. Won't take but a moment." Well, of course, a moment in the mind of God is quite different from our moments. But um, 
I had to work through my own resistance to doing it because really I'm the last person I ever would have thought in a million years would have written a book about Jesus considering my family background. <clears throat> but the way I really began was I taught a six month series called The Alchemist Dream and I'll be teaching some of that series with a lot of updates starting on Wednesday which began with the Egyptian mysteries, moved to the Jewish mysteries, and then went to the Christian mysteries, okay? And then I began to write in earnest that June. Now, within two weeks, I realized that the theme for this book was quite different from the other book, that the theme for this was really about the presence of the Great White Brotherhood in Jesus' life. And then I began to ask for historical information to be brought to me about the Great White Brotherhood because the thing is, as beautiful and profound as channeled information is, you cannot be taken seriously by anyone in the academic or historic world by quoting channeled information. It has to be historical documents. So if I was going to make a difference in world consciousness, I felt like I had to uh, really have historical facts. So about a month later, um, one morning, my guides download a lot in the, in the morning, you know, four or five, six, how many of you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm, right. <laughs> it's like, to get, yeah, it's so like, I suddenly, this being appeared by my bed that looked just like Jesus, but he was a hair's breadth different. And the only thing he said to me was, Sanat Kamara. Mm -hmm. And then he vanished. Well, all that week I was being taken into these initiation ceremonies with these people in white, and they made this sign of the serpent on my forehead. Well, of course, you know, I have my fundamentalist background. You know, I'm like, the serpent! Okay. So, my room, you know how we are. The, my roommate, my housemate at the time was a lovely Indian man, very conscious man named Shankar. And so he called later that week, and I said, Shankar, listen, do you know anything about Sanat Kamara? He said, oh, he is one of the four great Kumaras. I was like, well, who are they? He said, oh, the Sanat Kumar, who is, of course, the head of the Great White Brotherhood. And I was like, oh, really? The head of the Great White Brotherhood? That's what I've been praying for. And I said, well, who else? He said, well, the Sananda Kumara, who was, of course, Jesus. And I was like, really? <laughs> I was like, well, who are the other two? And he said, well, the Sananka Kumara. And I was like, well, what's his story? He said, oh, his whole thing is about trying to raise the consciousness of the planet through teaching. Well, that would be Thoth, because Thoth set up all the great mystery schools. Thoth was the god of wisdom in Egypt. And in fact, a hundred years after Jesus, the early church father, Clement of Alexandria, said that the entire knowledge of the world was contained within the 42 books written by Thoth that were it was in the great library of Alexandria. Um, Astronomy, astrology, mathematics, sacred geometry, architecture, law, music, vibration, harmony, healing, herbs, you name it, those knew about it. The master initiate. And it's who the great, the great White Brotherhood calls the great world teacher. Okay? If you ever read Ledbetter or Rudolf Steiner or um, Madame Blavatsky or um, um, Manly P. Hall, he's spoken of as the great world teacher. And I said, well, who's the, who's the fourth one? Ah, oh, that would be Sanandana, uh, S Sanandana, not Sananda, but Sanandana. I said, well, what's his, what's his MO? And he said, ah, oh, he only comes, he very rarely comes into the world. He only comes in times of greatest darkness. I'm like, well, greatest darkness, why? He said, when, when it is so dark that he must fight to, to push back the dark. Well, that would be Horus. That would also be Rama and Krishna. Think about the MOs. Each one of those, they're shepherd kings. They are uh, minstrels of heaven. You know, they have the whole music thing going on, the healing thing going on. But all, each one of them had to sort of pony up to fight back the darkness in their age, in their time. In the Ramayana, it was... Um, Rama fights Ravana. <clears throat> Ravana was the, he was probably a reptilian alien, is probably who he was. But Ravana was, you know, raiding the monasteries in Tibet and in China and killing the monks and eating them, half eating them, which was completely terrorizing the neighborhood villages, okay? So um, <coughs> Ravana was quite a, you know, he was quite a number. And so the Ramayana is the story of Rama 
fighting and winning against Ravana. And even at the very end of the story, if you ever read the Ramayana, it's so beautiful, Ravana says to him, Oh, great Lord, he said, do you not know why I have ravaged the world? It is only to get your attention because it was the only way that I could be close to you. Can you imagine such a thing? So, the four great Kumaras, I talk about them in my book. But this three steps of initiation, the very first level of the mysteries, were called the lesser mysteries, and they were about the Divine Mother. Not because the Divine Mother is any less than the Divine Father, but because they were the foundational mysteries, and without them you can't understand anything. Now this is an important point, because in Christianity we only have the second level of the mysteries. The second level of the mystery is, is the Divine Father and the Divine Son and how the Divine Father comes into the world as the Divine Son. We got that in Christianity. You know, it's very beautiful. But the third level of the mysteries is the integration of the two, forming, in fact, what Jesus taught, which is the Ithcus, or the fish, or the Eye of Horus. You cannot have the integration of the two unless you have two to integrate you must have masculine and feminine. And when Jesus talks about in the Gospel of Thomas, you know, you must make the two eyes into one and the inner into the outer and the outer into the inner and the male into the female and the female into the male. And when you will do this, then you will find the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about the integration between the left and the right hemispheres, which is through the corpus casalum. We will take a break in a minute, and I will pat another life in the, what is it? What's the bottom? Put another tape. I will put another tape in, as uh, you wish. Do we need two, two minutes, or what do you need? Two, just a, a few minutes for uh, a break. Okay. Uh, I, I didn't want to disturb you, no but, but this is about to run out. Of no here. problem. Do you, uh, <coughs> okay, would you guys like to, do you want to take, you, do you have another minute to just kind of finish my thought? Yeah, please do that. Please okay, do. so. So this integration of the two is, of course, the Divine Mother energy and the Divine Father energy, which forms a very sacred symbol that's called the Vesica Pisces. How many of you know what the Vesica Pisces is? How many of you don't know? Okay. The Vesica Pisces is um, the seed's energy of creation. Okay. In sacred geometry, it is the fundamental shape. And in the ancient world, all cities and holy sites and holy temples were formed through the merger of this Vesica Pisces. Gosh, that is not very good, is it? Okay, I'm so sorry, but here we are. So this energy, this is the Vesica Pisces right here, okay? Now let's think for just a minute. Do we have time to think for a minute or do we need to stop? We have another minute to think. This is good. Okay. So, so, so this seed energy is called was called the Om Phallus. Now, what does that remind us of? The female and the male. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. The male and the female joined together, and it was the egg energy. It's an oval energy. So this is why we have the Oval Office in Washington. The Masons knew this. In Delphi, the Temple of Delphi in Greece, we have the Omphallus. It looks like a big old seed. I've got a picture of it in my book. Okay. In Egypt, it was at the Temple of Heliopolis, the Temple of the Sun. Okay. Without the Sun, guess what? There's no emanation of light or life in our solar system. So the sun was always connected with this. And the way that the sacred landscapes of the ancients were laid out is with the seed in the center and 12 divisions around it, much as we have the 12 constellations of the zodiac, as Jesus had 12 apostles, as the chief druid had 12 assistant druids around him, as Mithra had 12 apostles around him. 
It's all, as Thoth would say, as above, so below, as below, so above. It's really wonderful doing this work, especially when um, I have so many sort of gifted people in the audience. Uh, a couple of my clairvoyant friends back there on the break said that uh, when I sat down in this very chair, you know, right when James was first, you know, introducing, saying hello to everybody in the beginning, you know, I was like, okay, guys, come on in. And, you know, <laughs> my girlfriend was like, you know, how the feel, you know, shifts because they, they're definitely in. And, you know, when I did my book signing on Thursday night at the Phoenix and Dragon last Thursday, you know, we did a meditation. I always try to do different things every time I speak because, you know, I, um, that way it, it makes it fun for me and it makes it fun for all of you. And you can, you know, come to many different things. And, you know, even though you have to sit through hearing a little bit about me each time because they're always new people, you know, that it, kind of moves to a whole nother level. And um, so my friend Perry was there on Thursday night and we did a meditation where we brought in, you know, the Great White Brotherhood in the beginning and the end. So he calls me up uh, the next morning and he said, yep, I was taken to the 12th level of the Great White Brotherhood. <laughs> it, they were in all night long, the Order of Melchizedek. <laughs> And so, I mean, honestly, there is a transmission level that is happening. And one of you asked me on the break about the kundalini energies. And I want to just very briefly address that. You know, there's four kinds of chi, air, earth, fire, water. When we breathe, we're involved with air chi. Deep breath, we oxygenate our body, our cells. Most of us are shallow breathers. Fire chi you know, which is, you know, the kundalini energy that moves up the spine, earth chi, you can learn how to drop golden grounding rods down into the earth and pull uh, from the electromagnetic energy field of the earth, and then uh, uh, water chi, which really has to do with uh, crying, expressing emotion, and so forth. And so one of you was asking me about kundalini chi, which is, of course, fire chi. Now, this goes back to the teachings of the great master Thoth, and where the heck is that? Oh, here it is. You know, um, here is the spine, which was called the shashuma, and it's a, it's a, or prana tube, okay? And there are circuits that move like this, uh, like the staff of Moses, that was one serpent, okay? Or the staff of, of um, Hermes or Thoth, which is two currents. This is the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system in the physical biology of the body, which represents the male and the female currents. And they cross at the seven major chakra points. The whole idea of initiation is, let's just say, you know, your, um, your prana tube is, is, uh, can only hold this much water or this much light. In initiation, you're trying to expand your capacity to hold more light. Now, how can we make this glass bigger? Okay, let's just say, for example, uh, there's an eraser in your glass. This eraser is a blockage. Okay, we call it a miasm, an aberration, a wound, a negative belief system, a curse, a vow. Um, some erroneous belief system that's not really serving you. Well, of course, wherever the miasm is, you can't get water. You can only get the water around the blockage, right? In initiation, you call in more light, but as it comes in to this prana tube, it expands the tube. Well, let's say it hits your your power issues or your sexual issues or your, you know, your lack of forgiveness for that horrible person that raised you or your um, belief that even though you're a spiritual person, you're not worthy to connect with God or see the divine, whatever your belief is. Not just in this lifetime, but, you know, we have, you know, multiple, multiple lifetimes. And whenever we don't clear something from another lifetime, it's still in us at a subconscious level, okay? Even if our conscious mind says, I want to be rich and famous and have great sex and make lots of money, okay? If you've been, <laughs> let's say you've been a priest or a priestess or a nun and you've taken vows of poverty, celibacy, and obedience, okay? 
your conscious mind sets off to go find that perfect mate and make lots of money and win the lottery, and before you know it, you're back over here, and you can't figure out what's happening. Well, it's because we are, you know, as a soul, we are the collective sum total of everything that we are. And so what happens is when this energy comes in in initiation, it hits these blockages. And, you know, as they say, the, the doo-doo will hit the fan, okay? <laughs> Stuff will come up for us. And so in order to have more room for the light, we have to clear this thing out. This is why spiritual work is not always easy, okay? This is why sometimes people who are, seem like that they're spiritually oblivious look like they have easier lives than some of us because we actually have committed to finding out what the heck this thing is and dissolving it and get, doing away with it. You guys know what I'm talking about here? Okay. So um, I brought some interesting gifts for you today. Now, in my book, which originally had about 170 illustrations, but they did use 103 of them, which is great. Because since we're teaching hermetics, if you can see it, you can get it, okay? And my, my, my friend Ellie, who's been through my mystery school, she said that one of our other priestess sisters was reading it. Tell her what she just said. She said, I don't even know how she... The book is a very easy read, but it is an initiation in itself. Um, what was it you were downloading about how many... 144. So in the very first, the book is divided into six sections. In the very beginning, the first two chapters are about the fact that there were these great... Uh, mystery traditions. Most Judeo-Christian people don't know because we weren't told and we weren't educated the fact that there is a great white brotherhood, that there are these beautiful chapters or orders of light, and that these mysteries were taught for 4,000 years before Jesus was born and some 400 years after Jesus died and was resurrected. So um, in the beginning, in those first two chapters, I explain how they were taught, how they used hermetics, and I give examples of how, for example, the cross and the bee, these are two very simple hermetic devices. If you don't know what they look, if you don't know what they mean, you just think it's a bumblebee. But the bee, in the ancient world, there were only two ways to preserve anything, honey and salt. So the bee represented the preservers of the nectar of wisdom who were holding it for future generations, preserving it for future generations. So this is why the Mithran priest had a bumblebee looking hats, and this is why the, <coughs> the Pope has a bumblebee looking hat. This is why the bee is on the Pope's crest. And it also that bumblebee looking hat represents the pineal gland and the activation of that third eye. Okay? That's just one simple example. And there's many that I transmit throughout the book. In the, then we begin really with Jesus' life, and so we take on the mysteries of what the great star of Bethlehem was. And I, um, you know, when Jesus said, don't worry, I'll open every door, I must tell you, this has been a very interesting experience in writing this book because I would get to a part where I would think, well, you know what I really need here is, you know, a historical document from the Vatican. Well, I literally had a book materialized on my shelf I wound up getting access to some of the 560,000 documents hidden in the Vatican that no one's seen for hundreds of years. I, I had all these rare historical things be brought to me. I mean, people that uh, just literally, Duane and um, Lynn were two of those people who showed up and said, do you know about this hidden secret book that Joseph of Arimathea took to Britain and was buried until 1174 in the Great Fire of Glastonbury? where the very first Christian church was set up in 37 AD. I'm like, no. They're like, well, we're bringing it over for you. So the process of writing it has been a series of miracles. And so in that section, we begin to take on the mysteries of really what was the star of Bethlehem. And in fact, there were four stars and there were four wise men, but the fourth one didn't make it. Uh, and they came from four directions, north, south, east, and west. We know one of them was Egyptian because, you know, in the Bible, you're only given this much about the whole thing about Herod and the wise men. I have two pages from the Vatican Library uh, from a reporter that was hired by the Sanhedrin High Council to go interview the priest of Bethlehem, whose name was Melker, and um, the shepherds themselves to find out what they saw. 
So these four lights join together into one great light and send a beam of light down. And uh, the scene stories were that Jesus' soul traveled in this beam of light into, into the body of the child. Who knows if that's true, but that's very interesting. And I have a first town account from in a scene that saw this happen. Uh, the four c connect into one. And then we begin with the next section, which is really when Jesus goes to Alexandria. Now, most of us sort of, you know, on our Christmas cards, how, you know, how Joseph and Mary and the donkey, everyone looks poor, and, they're, and we've watched all these Hollywood versions. They're all poor, and everyone's uneducated. And <laughs> Alexandria was literally the New York City of its day. It was the mecca of spiritual and philosophical wisdom from the Greeks, the, uh, the esoteric Jewish uh, teachings. The Buddhists were there. Buddha was 500 BC. The Buddhists had already moved into that area. The Egyptian high culture. It was the flowering. And Alexandria was the capital for a thousand years. Started around 333 BC and going strong for another 700 years. So we begin by you know, talking about that and the hidden teachings of the Essenes. Now, Jesus was definitely taught by the Essenes from the age of 8 to about the age of 13. The Essenes were very much into angels. And Jesus, there's all these hidden teachings I've found of Jesus's where he speaks about the 14 angels of transmission. And there are seven male and there are seven female. Okay, and he speaks openly about them and how important it is for us to connect with these angelic beings. And of course, all this was taken out. But th this appears in the Essene Gospels of Peace. And the Essene Gospels of Peace were found in the secret archives of the Vatican Library. And there was a young scholar who speaks like 14 languages who went there and studied there and um, became the student of the guy that was the head of the whole secret library. And when he brought them to this older man and said, I found these and I found similar references in Damascus and a number of other places in the monasteries, what, you know, what should I do? I mean, people need to know about this. The older man said, do what you must. He said what? Do what you must. He said, basically, I'm too old and too established to risk my career, but you're a young man, and I completely support you in doing exactly what you need to do to bring this to the public. So this man, Edward uh, Zelazny, wound up spending uh, his life translating from Aramaic the words of Jesus and put these out. Most people know nothing about these books. Okay, so, I mean, I speak about a lot of this. So then we move into the Celtic lands. I love that section because the Druids, he, he, he studied with the Druids from about the time he was 14, 15, 16, about two years. But he was so advanced that uh, they, and there was totally an oral tradition that, you know, they were like, send him on to India. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's okay. He, he needs to go on. So then he went to India, and there's a whole section on India and Persia. And uh, once he was initiated through the uh, Hindu teachings of the Brahmins, he began to teach his own thing. And he very quickly drew a crowd of three to 5,000 people, followers, because he taught to everyone alike. He was very democratic. And at that time, there was a... Um, very strong caste system in India. You had the Brahmins and the nobles, basically, those families. And then you had um, the uh, merchants, the military. Then you had the farmers and the peasants. And then finally you had the untouchables. The untouchables were never, that'd be like our garbage collectors. They were never allowed to hear scripture ever. The farmers and peasants could hear it once a year. That was it. And uh, you can see it was very restricted. So Jesus said that all people deserve a right to life, liberty, and what joy as the flesh may know, and the right for spiritual realization in this lifetime. So very quickly, he sort of uh, gathered, you know, had many, many followers, and this sort of upset the apple cart for the caste system, so they sent assassins to murder him. And I have two stories, one that the Magi warned him, and one that... Um, the farmers and peasants warned him, but he fled to Rajagira, and Rajagira is where the Buddha was enlightened. And he spent six years in Rajagira, where he was acknowledged there as the second Buddha that the first Buddha had prophesied would come some 500 years later. 
uh, he studied uh, Pali, he learned uh, the Pali tongue, P-A-L-I, the Pali tongue. And then when he left there, he traveled with the Magi to Persia, and he was initiated in the cave of Bukhara and the great star mysteries of Persia, which are very powerful mysteries that I talk about in the book that have to do with the procession of the equinox and how the movement of our Milky Way, our um, solar system within the Milky Way literally uh, brings us into higher or lower levels of evolution and consciousness. And this is uh, one of my, you know, I'm an astrologer and an astronomer uh, based, I'm sure I've been an astronomer in many lifetimes as a high priest, but um, I, in this lifetime m a lot of my work has been literally following the path of what the ancient Egyptians called the great duat. D-U-A-T, the great duat. How many of you know this word? Met the great beyond. And it's the avenue of the, the soul takes when it leaves the planet Earth. Because most of us just continue to reincarnate again and again and again and again here. We never get out. But the great mysteries taught how to finally uh, achieve Jivan Murti spiritual liberation, and how to stop your, the, the, the great wheel of Awagawan. The great wheel of Awagawan is the wheel of life and death and rebirth. Okay? And they taught the pathway or the road map out of our solar system into the great central sun at the center of our galaxy. And this is part of the great teachings of the Egyptian mysteries. And over the course of the next eight weeks, I'll be sharing this information with you, you know, in the mystery school teachings on Wednesday nights at the Unity North. Um, but um, today, I brought with me a little gift for all of you. They, as I mentioned to you, they worked very much with this concept of the light, great white brotherhood, uh, and enlightenment. And uh, consequently, they worked very much in the idea of the 12 around the 1, because the 12 zodiacal signs around the central one puts us right at the point of the sun or the Christ, the living Christ. And so I brought, um, how many people are there in this room? Does anybody know? Can somebody count? OK, well, I think I brought 30. Uh, so um, what I brought, you guys, are two sacred wheels, charts, for yourself to contemplate on. I suggest you put it someplace very cool where you can look at it all the time and let it begin to work on, your, on the inner planes for you. These are the 12 wheels of the mystery school in the, in the outer forms of the different religions. And if you can just take one and pass it back. And let me, here, let me. And then I brought you one that does not appear in my book because, of course, of my 170 illustrations, I only got to put 103 in. So this is a secret one. And these are some of the highest level inner orders that most people know very, very little about. So the first one you're getting is one that most of us can identify. You know, we have the mysteries of Turtle Island in the north and the south, the Jewish mysteries, the Christians, the Persian, the African, the Egyptian, the Indian, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is the hidden secret inner orders. I printed these right before I left the house. Aren't we proud that I actually got this done? <laughs> And, I'm, you know, I'm going to be on Coast to Coast. You know, Art, uh, George Norris. How many of you guys know what Coast to Coast is? Coast to Coast is like 10 million, 10 to 20 million listeners. And we don't listen to it here, most of us, unless you listen archive because it's an L.A. show. And so it comes on at 11 to like 3 in the morning. So our time is 1 to 4, so or 1 to 5. So, I mean, you know, you'd have to really be a night owl. But they do archive the shows, and I think you can pay like 60 bucks a year or something and listen to any of the shows. So um, a week from Monday, I'm going to be on, and I'll just tell you this very funny story. My, my publicist for this book, who is the publicist that handled The Secret, um, I get her for just another month. That's it. Um, she set up the pre-interview, and she said, well, you know, you have to be very short and very succinct. They're very busy people and so forth. You'll get on and off the phone in 15 to 20 minutes. That's it. They kept me on the phone for an hour and a half. 
and they said, we want you on this Monday night for three hours. And, you know, you could sort of like hear the cheers to the email, yay! But then my publisher was like, wait a minute, the book's not even going to be in the bookstore. <laughs> so they moved it to the 15th. It's, the book is literally just arriving in Barnes and & Noble and Borders. And so, you know, I would urge you, if you can, to, to get it here simply because um, I actually have to pay for all the books that I order, okay? So if you get it at Phoenix and Dragon, which is great, because I'm going to be there three more times, you know, Candace gets to make a little money. But otherwise, you know, if you buy it here, I actually get to pay my publisher for the books I've bought from them. But um, I'm very excited about being on it, but I realized that um, I could wind up having, you know, 10 million hits, literally, on my website. So I have one week to put together anything, I mean, I was like, oh my God. So if anybody knows anyone that knows how to do PayPal codes, I'm in desperate need of some, I lost my web designer, and I'm in desperate need of somebody, oh, you are my man, all right. <laughs> all right, see me after the class. Okay, so we're gonna pass out now the 12 rays of the Great White Brotherhood. And these include perhaps some inner orders that some of you may have heard of. And I'm going to call them out and see if you've heard of them. Please raise your hand. The Order of the Violet Flame. That one was started by Saint Germain. See, I'm with cool people in the Theosophical Society. <laughs> the Order of the Golden Robe. That is a gorgeous order. And Lama, uh, Lantos, who's behind those biogenesis tools. How many of you know about biogenesis? <laughs> Lantos is behind that order, Order of the Golden Rome. The Order of the Emerald Cross, that was an order started by Thoth in Atlantis long ago. The Aleutian Mysteries, that's Greece, of course. Uh, the Mithric Mysteries. The Order of the Golden Phoenix. The Order of Melchizedek, that's in the Old Testament. The Order of the Viragi, you've learned about them today. The Priestesses of Isis, you've learned about them today. The Knights Templars and the Freemasons, okay? The Order of the Rosy Cross, the Rosicrucians, very beautiful, beautiful order, Christian Rosencrantz. The Order of the White Dove. So these are the, the, some of the 12 inner orders. Okay, I think um, I've probably pushed our little one-hour talk to, you know, here we are at 4.30. Are there any questions or thoughts or anything anyone would like to ask or share before we take a break, get a flyer in the back for my little speaking engagements if, if you'd like, get a flyer on the mystery schools and if, um, and I think I might have a few books left back there for Dialogues of the Angels and I brought just a few CDs. I've, I've been putting together a number of DVDs on the Egyptian mysteries, the Jewish and Christian mysteries. Those are not quite reproduced yet but hopefully sometime in the next month I'll have them done where you'll be able to get them but I brought just a few today. Uh, as well as the books. <coughs> Any thoughts, questions? Your book on angels, you talk about uh, uh, guides, but uh, those guides really, I don't call them guides. They're, they're spirits. They're, they're what I call uh, advisors. And I have two advisors also. I don't doubt it. So, uh, but uh, You're right, they are. We also have four guides, four spirit guides that have lived in past lifetimes. So uh, I don't know what we call them except advisors. That's what I call advisors them. Advisors is a very good word for Perhaps. it. I use them all the time. I like that. Good. Anybody else? <coughs> Was this fun? Yes. Very good. Did you learn something? Yes. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I am in town. Uh, I do uh, still do readings for people. They're not your normal clairvoyant, you know, just psychic readings. They're really at a deeper level of who are you as a soul, what has your journey been through time, through millions and millions of years, what's brought you into this <coughs> lifetime, who are those wonderful guides that are around you. You know, if you have things that block you, many times I can see what those are. Many times I can clear them, and if I can't clear them, and I clear a lot of things, I have a couple of wonderful friends that can clear them. Um, uh, so, um, How much is the reading? Uh, I charge $150 for the first hour, and the hour really starts when I push the tape recorder down, not when you ring the doorbell, you know. And usually at the beginning of the reading, I'll give you about 10 minutes to sort of say, look, this is who I am, this is the part I know, and this is the part I don't know, and this is why I'm here. And then the really, the process for me 
You know, every clairvoyant is different. It's, it's kind of like painters. You could have 20 painters and they'd all have different styles. For me, my Mercury and my Venus are aligned with the center of the galaxy in the 12th house, which is the mind of God and the secrets. So my question has always been, what's behind that? You know, pulling the veils back. As they say, you know, the goddess has, you know, she of a thousand veils. So um, when I first started reading some 30 years ago for people, the first four years I read, I just read for free because my, you know, my Clark Kent identity, my bread and butter was to be made as a photographer. And then it got to where it took so much time, I actually started charging money. And um, when I first started reading, I was going back three, four, five thousand years, and then I made a leap to where I was going back 50,000, 100,000 years. I found myself in Atlantis and Lemuria, um, and then in some cases, especially Atlantis, which was a star empire that had a lot of traffic coming in and out of it from other uh, solar systems. Uh, I would see sometimes my clients would come in in spaceships, you know, um, and I think, well, where were they before that? And so I began to pull the thread, and I found myself going to the Pleiades, going to Sirius A, or going to Sirius B, or Andromeda, or the Orion systems. And so I began really, you know, looking at the history of those individuals uh, and those places through those individuals' records. And then I thought, well, where was the soul before that? And I began to pull the thread and move up into the fourth dimension, the fifth dimension, and eventually up beyond the worlds of time and space. And one of the things that I discovered is that each one of us come from the angelic kingdom. We all begin in the angelic kingdom. Even though down here we have amnesia, we're kind of clueless, and we certainly don't act like angels. You know, <laughs> we act like mortals. <laughs> But um, because of that uh, realization, I then began to ask the question, well, wait a minute, if we began so perfectly, what happened? So I began to track the soul down into the fifth dimension where I discovered how we got wounded, how we fell into the lies of separation, and how we can heal it. So while I certainly do address questions like, you know, your money, your job, your romance, your love life, all of those kinds of your health, I can address all of that. I'm really concerned with discovering who you are at a higher level so that you can become empowered in your path to understand what it is you're doing here in the here and now, and if there are things that are preventing you from taking the next step, what we can do to dissolve it so that you can step into uh, the fullness of what your real intent is in coming here. So. Yeah, how old uh, are the masters individually? I mean, are they born and do they die uh, during a normal lifetime, or do they live much longer than a normal lifetime? Well, both. Um, they, they come down here and they, just like us, every master has to go through all the mortal experiences that we've had to go through. They suffer just like we do, and they eventually <laughs> achieve a level of mastery or consciousness. And some will choose to stay. For example, in the Viragi, there's five or six that I have worked with. One's about 5,000 years old, one's about 3,000, one's about 350 years old, actually about 375 now. Um, so some will maintain mortal bodies. Others will pass on into the fourth dimension or the fifth and be on assignment there in what are called the temples of golden wisdom. And you can actually journey through soul travel, as I said at the beginning of the talk. You can learn to raise your consciousness to go there and, and study with them. There are also um, halls of invention. I've been to incredible museums on the inner planes and places where there are things that haven't been invented down here that are already existing in those levels, much as like Leonardo da Vinci, you know, would travel there and come back and draw helicopters and airplanes and things that weren't known in his time, but clearly he was accessing information that already existed at the higher level and downloading it. So all of us have the capacity to do so. What I would say in soul travel, it's very, very important. The very first law of uh, from my point of view, of uh, working interdimensionally is to use protection. This is very important because in the interdimensional worlds, um, you know, 
the roadmap, there's 12 basic dimensions, seven below in the worlds of time and space, and five above. And we're, and there are 12 sub-octaves to every level. So about the time Jesus came, we were about in the seventh sub-octave of the third dimension. We're now at about the 11th sub-octave of the third, moving up into the fourth. Everything moves in a spiral. Time moves in a spiral. Space moves in a spiral. All of that. So, you know, in every dimensional level, the laws change. You're still, as long as you're in the lower worlds, you're still dealing with some level of time and space. Okay? At this level, there's no time or no space when you're up at a high enough level beyond the worlds of time and space. But in these levels, you're still dealing, can you guys see, still dealing with the worlds of time and space. But in the third dimension, there's 48 laws that must be obeyed. In the fourth dimension, there are 24 laws. In the fifth dimension, there are 12 laws. In the sixth dimension, there are six laws. And in the seventh dimension, there are only three laws. So as you can imagine, as you go up, from our point of view, there are things that a fourth dimensional being can do that look like magic to us, fifth dimensional magic. Okay, et cetera, et cetera. So as we come down, it actually becomes more constricted. And so it becomes a harder curriculum. It's much easier for us to hang out in the sixth and seventh dimension where there's like no real negativity. When you hit the fifth dimension, you begin to hit the worlds where there's negative and positive. And at this level, there are masters of light and there's masters of darkness that are very much trying to influence everything below it. But you cannot get past the top of the fifth dimension into the sixth dimension without surrendering to the Christ consciousness. That's what Jesus meant when he said, no one comes to the Father except through me. The reason is because we pick up and we lay down our egos in the fifth. We pick up our egos here. When we're at this level, we're working on our individuation, but we, ha we have not picked up an ego. We pick up our ego in the fifth dimension. And this gets into very deep secret teachings within the great mystery schools around the tree of life and the, the nature of the great abyss between the fifth and the sixth dimension and how one must die to oneself. This is part of the esoteric meaning behind being born again. We must die to the ego. And of course, you know, that takes sometimes some pretty serious stomping, you know. <laughs> so that's really how it goes. Thank you for your question. Thank you all so much for today. It was a pleasure. I hope to see you Wednesday and Thursday night. And um, my pleasure. God bless. Thank you, Treasure. Thank you so much. Sure.